Hi, this is Devin Olavsky, and welcome back to the Reverend Olavsky Show. And whether you're watching with our friends over at Tarani Time, or wherever you watch or listen to your podcast, as always, thank you for joining us as we get ready for Shavuos. Ah, Shavuos, isn't it exciting here in Israel? We have a two-day Shavuos. Outside of it, so you have a three-day shvuas. What could be better than that other than open-heart surgery? I'm just kidding. I'm not a big fan of two days. Yet, that's why I moved to Israel in the first place. But uh, uh, it certainly gives you a lot of opportunities. Opportunities. And uh, I remember hearing a story a long time ago about this Greek um, uh, piano tuna. And uh, uh, his name was Zoltan. Was it Zoltan? I don't remember. Opernakidi. What a strange name. Anyway, so he comes to tune the piano, and when he leaves, it's even worse than it was before. So uh, they call him up and say, I want you to come back and fix it. And he goes, Opernakidi tunes only once. <laughs> Trust me, that's a very hard joke to work into anything. But anyway... So it's an opportunity, I mean, an opportunity <laughs> filled with Kedusha and opportunity. So let's focus on one aspect. Um, and I've spoken about this before. And that is that uh, Judaism definitely is, is based on food. <laughs> That's one of the big things about us. We Jews, we, we Jews are into food. It's just, it's just true. Uh, I found at least three places in the Chassam Sefer where he explains why we eat certain foods at certain times and certain things. And uh, the food that we eat, everything that we eat has, uh, has significance. Why are we eating that and what we're doing with it? So um, uh, when we uh, look at anything, Right, the, there's a concept Yisrael Kedoshim Him. Jews are holy people, so if we do something, there's got to be a reason for it. We don't just do things for no reason. So uh, whatever we eat is obviously of significance. Now, if it wasn't for the Minhagim, Shavuos would be just a Shabbos. It'd be nothing, right? You go to Shul at night. You'd have your Suda. Go to sleep. Get up in the morning and daven. Spend your yuntif as you usually spend your yuntif. You have a suda. You learn. Chreis, take a nap. Yeah, daven mincha. It's over. That's an extra. We have one day, right? That's what it would be. Of course, the minhagim have transformed it. Taking a little shvuas, um, staying up all night changes the entire nature of the day. Uh, there's another aspect to it. There's another. Um, minig, and that's to eat milchigs. To eat milchigs. Now, there's different ways that this minig is practiced. <clears throat> Some people actually do like the Ramo, where they eat a milchig suda, and then they bench, and they do kinur hanadocha, wash out their mouth, and then they go for a walk around the block like the Erev Pesach, Shabbos trick, where you have to make some kind of a break between your meals. Then they come back, and then they have a a, a of meal. The idea being that they were Mekayim having Melchigs for the Minig, and uh, they also have a Fleshiga meal because it's Yantif and Ein Simcha El Babosa. I met one person who did that. Most people... Uh, have fleshics. I'm talking about here in Israel. They have fleshics. And in the morning, when they come home from shul, they have a kiddush, they have a piece of cheesecake. Now, when I grew up, we had a regular milchig suda, shvuas night. We uh, had lasagna and eggplant parmesan and blintzes and onion soup with cheese in it and, uh, um, you know, cheesecake. Oh, really, a uh, uh, a fine selection of milchig products, high in carbohydrates, calories, um, and uh, you could feel your arteries hardening as you were eating the food. It was uh, very special. Um, so, uh, so that's what we always did. We used to have the uh, milchig suda at night, and then we would have a flesh suda for uh, for the day meal. 
So I come to Eretz Yisrael, because say, no, no, you know, there's Yantif, you know, you're milking meal, yeah. So, yeah, I have a flesh of So, uh, you know, I was bullied, as I often am. And so I changed my family's minig. And then at some point, I used to dive in upstairs in my building by the minion of Chaim Kreisworth. And uh, one of the family members mentioned, what do you mean? Reb Chaim has milchik's truest night. There's nobody flashing, it just has milchik's. I was like, what? He says, yeah, so did the stipler. They had regular milchik's at night. So I went back and uh, re-embraced my heritage. And we had a milchig uh, uh, dinner at night. Now the question is, why? Yeah, what's the, where's the source of this minig? And there's so many different sources and so much discussion on it that it really deserves a discussion, each one of these reasons by themselves. One of them is, Chol of Begematria is 40. And just like it takes 40 days to get to Torah, milk represents that. And in fact, the Gemara says Torah is compared to milk. Torah is also compared to honey, Torah is also compared to water, Torah is compared to a lot of things, but okay, we're getting the Torah, so we, we have milchigs. That's one reason. There's a reason lo zechisi lahaven, that's given, that says like this. They came back from Har Sinai, and uh, they wanted to eat, so if they were you know, going to uh, have fleshik, they just got the Mitzvah Shrita, they didn't know what it was. So they're going to have to kasha their kalim, have to sharpen the knife, they're going to have to shech the behemoth, they have to soak and salt the meat, and then cook it. So instead, you know, take some, uh, you know, take some kaj cheese, and sit down and have a little suda. The problem I have with this is that they were eating mun, so <laughs> I don't see. Why well, that should have made uh, as much of a difference, but okay, okay, those are chizil oven, but uh, but that's the um, that's uh, another reason that's given. So um, I always thought about it this way, and this is my approach to the idea of uh, of eating milchigs on shavuos. Is it a is the gemara? Whether or not. This concept of chazi lochem and chazi Hashem is really a thing. Do you have to spend half of the day eating and drinking and celebrating, or could you spend the whole day sitting and learning? It's not like it's in the Gemara. But the Gemara points out that even the one who says there is no mitzvah to eat or drink on the other days of Pesach and Shavuos, there's for sure a mitzvah to eat on Shavuos. Because that's when the Torah was given. Well, that seems slightly counterintuitive. When the Torah was given, which is a day of pure spirituality, that's the day that you're supposed to eat and drink and celebrate. So the Masil Susharim, and you know we have two online Masil Susharim Shirim, it's not too late to join. Um, one is in the Kias and one is still in Zerizis. But um, at the end, you come to a level called Kedusha. The Masil Shasharim says, let me explain to you the difference between a Kadosh and a Taha. A Taha purifies everything that he does in this world. And whatever he does, he makes sure to remove the negativity of the Gashmias and leave only the essential amount of Gashmias that he needs in order to be able to function. So you minimize as much as you can the physicality. That's a toha. But when you reach a kadosh, it's a different level. Because a person who is a kadosh, and this is his lashon, who mikdash, who mishkan, who mizbeach. And therefore, there is no physicality. Whatever he eats is a carbon being burnt on the Mizbeach. Whatever he drinks is wine being poured onto the Mizbeach as Nesachim. There is no more physicality. The physicality becomes 
spirituality. The two of them meld together. That's the power of Torah. So on a regular yantif, when we say chatsi lochem and chatsi l'ashem, it's because we're looking at it from two different perspectives. The learning and the davening, that's for Hashem. The eating and drinking, that's for me. But on Shavuos, when we get the Torah through the power of Torah, even the eating and drinking gets elevated to a level of spirituality. There is no double message over here. There's only Torah, and Torah, you know, Torah is compared to Aish. And one of the things about fire is whatever you put into the fire turns into fire. Torah has that ability that whatever you put into Torah turns into Torah. It has to be real Torah. Not that you're compartmentalizing. On the one hand, I have my Torah. On the other hand, I have my physical pleasures. And they're two different things. But on Shavuos, where I go through seven days, seven times to take the entire world and purify it. And then on the 50th day, 50 is outside of this world. Seven, this world is six sides in the point in the middle. And seven times seven, I take every one of those facets and I complete them. And then I go to 50. 50 is outside of this world. Rules don't apply there. It's outside of time and space. It's a totally new reality. And that's why we've mentioned this in the past. But the famous uh, Chazal that says, um, before Kishbo gave us the Torah, he offered it to the nations of the world. So he says to Yishmael, you want the Torah? He says, what does it say? It says, lo uh, signoif. He says, how can I accept that? The Torah says, per odem yad bekol bekol yad bala. The Torah says I'm a thief. He goes to Esav and says, what do, you want the, uh, do you want the Torah? He says, what does it say? It says, lo sirtzach. What do you mean? The Torah says, the Torah says, I'm a murderer. How can I accept a Torah that tells me not to murder when the Torah itself tells me I'm a murderer? So it sounds like a good argument. And it is a good argument. The mistake they were making is that you think those limitations can never change. But when you accept the Torah, this is, this is an amazing thing. Like Maureen Yuvamis, um, two times in a row, it, it asked a similar question. Um, you have a mitzvah peri rivia to populate the world. So what if this non-Jew had children and then he converted? Does he still have to have children? After all, he populated the world. So it's Machlekes. Rabbi Yechonen says he's Yotze and Reish Lakish says he's not. Uh, says Rabbi Yechonen, even non-Jews have a mitzvah peri rivia. And Reish Lakish says, you're right. But when a person is Megaya, they become a new person. All is erased. You start over again. There is nothing. You're a different person than you were beforehand. And so therefore, whatever you did beforehand doesn't count. And there's a similar discussion where it says, why does it seem that Gerim have more Tsaris than regular Jews? Regular Jews have plenty of Tsaris. We tell that to a person before they decide to convert. But it says, why does... Why does it seem that a that a non Jew that a, a non Jew who converts has even more tsaris than a regular Jew? So the Gemara first suggests maybe it's because when he wasn't Jewish he didn't keep the six Noahide mitzvahs properly, and so now he we don't bother punishing a non Jew because uh, you know give him whatever he has in this world who cares about Olam Haba? Now that he's a Jew he wants to finish up the cheshbon. And the Gemara responds, no, you can't say that because when you convert, you become a brand new person. So I can't be held responsible for what I didn't when I was an Anju. That was a different person. So when Yishmael and Esav say, we are thieves and murderers, you're right, but if you accept the Torah, all bets are off. You don't have to be who you were. You become a new person. It transforms you into somebody else. And that's why in order for Torah to work, you have to let go of all of your other past assumptions. And that's why people who go in and they say, well, I can't accept this. Or 
Uh, I don't think Hashem would say that. Uh, now, I may not be doing everything, but if I say no, that I'm not ready to accept, then you're not a ger. A ger who says I accept 612 mitzvahs, but not 613, not a ger. You have to accept everything, whether or not you keep everything as well or not, but you have to accept it. The person has to, to say, yes, this new reality is going to become my reality. And uh, that's a big challenge. But the Torah transforms things into something completely different. When a person allows the Torah to transform them, you can become a person of Kedusha. And you become a Mishkan and a Mikdash and a Mizbeach. You become an altar to Hashem and everything that you do gets filled with Kedusha automatically. There's no more physicality. The line between physicality and, and spirituality has ceased to exist. And everything becomes Kadosh. Okay. Hierarchy of foods. What's important? Bread? Bread is called the staff of life. Bread is what you need to um, to survive. The Gemara says, you're not a baradas until you can eat bread, wheat bread. If you can't eat wheat bread, then you're, you're, not, you're not an adult yet. You're not a baradas. So bread is essential. Meat? Somebody pointed out, if you just go with numerical halachas, the most halachas are about Shabbos. The next most is about Taras Mishpacha. The next most are the halachas relating to preparing meat to be eaten. The soaking and the salting and the shechita and the trebering and all the halachas that go into that. Uh, meat has a tremendous power to give you strength and to, to give you ein simcha el babasa, etc. Wine? Wine. Uh, there's a side in the Gemara that you can bench on wine. Um, uh, wine is uh, hilula. You give praises with wine. Um, we make a kiddish with wine. We make havdullah with wine. We get married with wine. Uh, wine is a very special one. Fruit of the tree. When they were created in Gan Eden, they ate fruit from the tree. That's what they ate. Everything grew on trees. And Fruit has a certain level of uh, halachas more than anything else. There's a din of orla. For three years, you're not allowed to touch the fruit of the tree. The fourth year, it's kadosh. The fifth year, you can eat it. But you see, the fruit itself has a special level of kadusha to it. Of all the foods we've discussed, probably the lowest that we deal with are vegetables. Vegetables have a din of trumas and maisa only midira bonan. Well, I'm not I'm excluding grain. But the arisa truma and maisa only applies to the five grains, um, the uh, uh, grapes and olives. Nothing else as truma the arisa. All the other vegetables we maisa it. There's no you know, it's not a concept of bikurim. Bikurim comes from trees and, and grain. Uh, all those kind of things are, are uh, don't have that same status. Uh, vegetables at least have something. There's only one thing that has no significance in Judaism, and that's milk. Milk, cheese, milk eggs. When I was in South Africa, they don't eat milk eggs. There's just no milk eggs there. I landed in Cape Town, and they took me for breakfast to the pie shop where they serve flay sugar pies, meat pies, chicken pies. You know, It was like 9 o'clock in the morning. I said, do you have anything that's not flay sugar? So we have apple pie. I said, okay, I'll take a piece of apple pie. You have a coffee? I'm like, uh, I guess I can make an instant coffee for you. And I said, do you have any milk? Fleischke restaurant. I can give you one of those little packets of powder. 
of a powder you could sprinkle in. You know, it clumps up on the top, and it's uh, an unpleasant drinking experience. I, it was one meal. I was there for over a week. There was only one meal that was milking. It was a fascinating experience. <laughs> Um, some people like milchigs more than flashigs. Yeah, but uh, from a religious point of view, think if you will. Where does milk and cheese have religious significance? Two times. Both of them are before women cut off a guy's head. They give him milk and cheese, they get thirsty, and then they, uh, they, they, they drink wine, and then they pass out, and then we cut off their head. Yeah, that's about it. You know, talk about lactose intolerant. <laughs> so in general, milk is not something that we look at from a religious point of view of having significance, except on Shavuos. Because on Shavuos, even milk eggs can be holy. Even that milk and cheese, which normally we wouldn't give any particular significance to, takes on a different, takes on a different level. There is one milchig dish that is described in the Gemara. It's called kutach. It's made with spoiled milk, moldy bread, and salt. And it was used as a very strong dip. The main reason it existed was to be able to create as many halachic problems as possible. It's milchigs, it's chametz, it's got salt, it's dava harif, what happens if it touches this, touches that, you know, oh, Kutach exists just to be able to warm the heart of a Pisic. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I never found that particularly attractive, but neither did I find Brie. So could be that that was what Kutach morphed into was uh, Brie. As Jackie Mason says, why do people eat Brie? It's only status. Nobody likes the way it tastes. It's disgusting. <laughs> so they say, we well, have to develop a taste. Where is it written that I have to be nauseous for six months till I develop a taste? Your sister-in-law, you have to develop a taste. She's family. <laughs> uh, keen insight. But um, uh, but milchigs has no... But even the most humble milchigs takes on significance on Shavuos. Even that can be lifted up. And I would like to propose that the reason we eat milchigs, dafka and Shavuos, is to be able to show the significance. It could be another reason, because someone gave me a copy of an article that appeared in the Journal of Coffee Drinking. There's apparently a journal. I have the article at home someplace. They say that the minig began around the same time that coffee became available throughout the Middle East. So Vices, the reason you eat milk is so that you can have milk in your coffee. I assume that's it, you know. It never occurred to any of the Mekubalim and Tzvas to get that parva powder and drop it in and then it clumps up on the top. It's disgusting. Anyway, but uh, it could be that's the reason. Yeah. In any event, however you want to look at it, um, this is, uh, this, the, there is this minute to have milchigs. And uh, like I say, whatever your minute is, whether you're eating a regular meal, I have one neighbor eats milchigs, both meals. I'm sure it's only eats milchigs. And I, other people have fleshing both meals and just have a piece of cheesecake at, at the Kiddush. Whatever it is, whatever the reasons are that will be meaningful to you, and I always say, you know, you have to find a, a reason that makes sense for you, that works for you. So, Amir Hashem, we go into Shavuos, this much is clear. We are the Torah, and the Torah has the ability to create a new reality for us to remove all of our limitations and to allow us to add Kedusha, holiness, into everything that we do in this world. And now questions. Interesting, uh, all of the questions were asked this week by Anonymous. Anonymous asks, is there a real future for Jews in America? I feel that we live in a time when there is not only a spiritual decline, but a spiritual decay something that is rotten deep inside. Everything might look nice on the outside, but there is clearly no passion and real devotion to Yiddishkeit. Can that change, or is there no real future here? Well, clearly there's no future because everyone is supposed to come to Israel, and, you know, Mashiach is going to come, and this is the future. 
there's no future in America. I think I may have told this story during the Aliyah series. Rabbi Meisman was speaking um, at a junior high. Um, and he not only is a big Rosh Hashiva, he's also uh, has a PhD in physics. So someone asked him in his role as a rabbi scientist, when Mashiach comes, now that we have satellite communication, it will know instantly when the base din declares Rosh Chodesh. Do we still have to keep two days here in Los Angeles? So Meisman said, well, when Mashiach comes, you're not going to be in Los Angeles, you're going to move to Israel. Horrified, the young man said, what, give up all this? So, yeah, the future is obviously here. But I told the story that I heard from Rabbi Zevlef, who was a Rav in Miami, and he was offered a job as a Rav in a small Moshav in Israel, Moshav Matasyo. And he says he asked both Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, and they both told him the same thing. The future of Yiddishkeit is in Eretz Israel. And if you have an opportunity to get something, grab it. Don't hesitate. So that's what they said many years ago. Um, I can tell you that I didn't travel much during Corona, but now when I go to America, it gets harder and harder to recognize the America I knew. And uh, things are just falling apart. Um, faster and faster, as you describe it. So is there a real future in America? No. Whether or not uh, a person can be successful there now under those circumstances that exist, like I say, with each year it gets harder and harder because the deterioration is happening so quickly. Anonymous asks, when a person leaves this world, it's nice if they can leave behind something that can inspire the next generation. This could be books, or in your case, podcasts and recordings, which will continue to influence people. You should be well and healthy and happy till 120 and live to see many more grandchildren and great-grandchildren on Maine. What else can a person leave behind in this world that will help future people? I would also like to leave something down in this world for even one person to be inspired by. I don't think writing a book is for me. I don't know who it is for. But do you have any other ideas? Um, Elu told us, Noach, Noach, Ish, Tzadik, Hoya. Says Rashi, told us Noach, and it says he was an Ish, Tzadik, because there are two things that we create in this world, children and Maisim Tovim. So, if you invest in your family, and you invest in doing good things, not everyone is going to go and start a major organization, but everyone can help. Maybe you're the one who sets up the uh, decorations, uh, you know, at the Sheva Brachas. Maybe you are the one who's a good friend who listens to people who need an ear. But uh, the idea of leaving behind statues and, uh, and uh, great accomplishments, you know, it's the Maisim Toivim and the family that we leave behind that ultimately a Kosh Baruch Hu looks down and says, we left something in this world. So as much as you can do, work on being the best person you can be. Not everyone is zeichet to go out and build big organizations. I'm not. I always wanted to start a yeshiva. I never did. And there's lots of things I wanted to do that I was never able to do. Anonymous asks, why did Hashem make teenagers so reckless? What use is there in that? And if you want to go there, why do they physically mature at the same time? It seems like a recipe for disaster and often is. There's an important idea. A girl becomes a bas mitzvah at 12, a boy at 13. And yet, you're not chayv b'dinei shemayim until you're 20. What do you see? That 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, if something happens to you, it's not a punishment min shemayim. Hashem does not hold you responsible during those years. You see from this that the Torah created a concept called a teenager. Why? Because when you are born, you have a Yetzirah. You don't get your Yetzirah Tov until you bar bat mitzvah. As such, there is nothing in this world as evil as a small child. All they have is evil. Yeah? Now, I don't mean that they're a Damien. You know what I mean? You're walking around with the knife. And you don't need that. 
All you need is the fact that they're not able to move outside of themselves. They're completely self-centered. And they just have a tendency to see things from their own perspective. And they can't be any more than that. That's, uh, that's Ra. Tov is to be able to move outside of yourself. So when you become 12 or 13, you suddenly have this new thing come into you called the Yetzirah Tov. But you're not used to it. Therefore, teenagers are capable of doing wonderful, deeply religious, spiritual, motivational things, and the most nasty, horrible things you could possibly imagine, sometimes at the same time. <laughs> Why? Because when you watch somebody learning how to drive, the big problem they have is the turns. They exaggerate all the turns, you know, and they don't know the key to driving is smooth, easy movements, but it takes a long time to get there. Most people uh, need time. That's what teenagers are supposed to be doing. They're, these changes have taken place in their spiritual reality, and they have to learn how to achieve a balance. And therefore, since the physical world always represents the spiritual world, all of a sudden, you're a cute little kid, and then a Kodesh Baruch Hu pumps you full of hormones. And you never start changing at the same time. So you have some kid who is in one of these Pirche choirs, la, 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 la. Suddenly he's like, la, 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 la. Your voice starts to change. And suddenly you break out in acne, and suddenly only your arms grow. <laughs> or suddenly your legs shoot up. <laughs> and you go through these emotional mood swings. You know? Why are you so upset? I don't know, okay? Okay, I don't know. You happy? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What do you want from me? My parents are like, I don't know. Do you know? I understand? No, because he's crazy. Because he's going through these wild emotional swings and physical swings and spiritual swings. So hopefully by the time that you're 20, you've established that equilibrium. So is it a difficult time? Sure. That's why in the time of the Gemara, people used to get married at their bar mitzvah. Even in Europe, it wasn't unusual. The mayor says, I got married at 14. If I got married at 13, I could have spit the satan in the eye. It's a good way to grow up with teenagers, uh, you know, married. Much healthier. But uh, now we create this artificial period that's, uh, that, you're right, creates problems. But the way it was made was so that people could spend their youth married, take all that energy and put it into something positive. Anonymous asks, what do you do when you're bored? You know, that's one of the great things about ADD. I'm never bored. I could be anywhere. You know, my mind takes me every place. I could just be sitting there and uh, life is, is always an adventure for me. So I don't, I don't know what it's like to be bored, like sit around like, hmm, I'm looking for something exciting. My mind is so exciting. And one of the things I like to do, and a number of my children who are more normal than I am, I won't go so far as to say normal, but they've picked this up with me, where, you know, you look at somebody and you say, what do you think his story is? <laughs> you see a couple and you say, what do you think the Shadchan was thinking with this? <laughs> it drives my wife crazy. So me and the kids, we, we do it like, you know, secretly. Like we just look at like, you know, like that. <laughs> but I, I just, I find life and people so fascinating. I'm never bored. I, I just look around and I see a world that's filled with beauty and excitement and filled with such interesting people. And every person is interesting. And you just look at them and, and you can develop a whole idea and story behind them and, and background. And, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. And sometimes I make these comments to myself uh, out loud and people over here, they were like, why did I say nothing? Nothing. I, I'm sorry. I was just speaking to myself. <laughs> My kids are also like, what is that? <laughs> so like I said, I don't really get bored. And besides, there's so many important things to do, so many people to talk to, and so many uh, uh, emails not to answer, and uh, so many shiurim to prepare for that, uh, you know, like I say, um, I don't really get bored. Sometimes I just get tired when I do a lot of physical exertion. I need some time down just to, like, space out. 
But even then, like I say, it's uh, all part of the adventure. Okay, that's it for this episode. If you want to find out more about the Shear, you can go to RabbiAlaski.com. You can sign up for Daf Yomi. You can sign up for Masil Shasharim. You can sign up for the Tefillah series, which is going just grandly. Uh, you can sponsor an episode. You can make a comment. You can ask a question. Send an email. And uh, that's about it. Uh, have a wonderful Shavuos. And Chag uh, Sameach. And until next time, I'm David Olavsky, and this is The Rabbi Olavsky Show. It's The Rabbi Olavsky Show. Torah and Simcha, ready to go. It's The Rabbi Olavsky Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode, and we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's The Rabbi Olavsky Show. On RabbiOrlovsky.com Torah Anytime YouTube and more It's Rabbi Orlovsky Show Torah and Simba Ready to go It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show Till next time Till we meet again It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show Show